Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. I'm Jane Goodman with the National Division of Public Health and Community Services. Before we get started with our guests, I'd like to give you a little bit of a public health update. Of course, we're still in a COVID-19 pandemic, so I wanted to let you know that we are still in high transmission across the United States. The Delta variant is accounting for 99% of the sequenced cases um, by our state. And over 90% of the hospitalizations due to COVID-19 are those that are not vaccinated. But more on that later. If we look at the United States, we have a nice map here. You see the only states that are declining here um, in transmission and high community transmission are California and Connecticut. And then we also have Puerto Rico um, that is even lower than those two states. Our seven day average for the nation is 201.3 cases per 100,000 with a 6.14% positivity rate. So we're at a little bit of a plateau in the United States, um, which is good, but still at a high rate of transmission. For the state of New Hampshire, you can see that um, in our far right map here, that Nashua unfortunately is darkened here. Um, and then you also see Stratford County is very dark as well. Um, so there's higher transmission in the city and in the region um, than in the state overall. So we do ask um, our residents to continue to take precautions, uh, wearing a mask and getting vaccinated um, until we can stamp this thing out for good. Um, as you'll see right now, we've had 123,000 cases um, in the state of New Hampshire. Right now we have 3,966 active cases. We have 54.5% of our state population that is fully vaccinated. And we have 59.8% that has had at least one dose. So if you know someone that's put off having that second dose, now is the time. It's never too late. Um, it's still very effective, even if you're outside that three or four week window. Uh, please get yourself on down to a uh, pharmacy or um, COVID shots are widely available at our health department as well. So please um, come on down and get that second dose. Very important to have full protection against COVID-19. We currently have 130 people being treated for COVID-19 in hospitals. Looking at Nashua itself, we have 186 active cases, over 300 cases per 100,000 um, in the state, uh, excuse me, in the city. And our total test positivity rate is 5.1%. So a little bit lower than the state average, but our cases per 100,000 are higher than the state average. In Greater Nashville, we have 517 active cases. If you look at our numbers, um, Nashville is a little bit lower um, in vaccination rate than the state. So those of you that are watching, please, if you have a friend, family, neighbor, um, someone walking by, make sure they're vaccinated, help them uh, find a vaccine. This is really critical for us getting through the next phase of this pandemic. Speaking of vaccine, uh, this next slide shows us our operational dashboard from the state. You can see again, unlike the other slide, Nashua is very light. That's because in comparison to surrounding areas, uh, both Nashua and Manchester, that other light spot you see, um, have very low vaccine rates, not very, have low vaccine rates in comparison to other areas of the state. We also have a low vaccine rate among 12 to 19 year olds in the state. It's about 36% right now. So if you have kids um, in that age range, uh, the Pfizer vaccine is available to them. So please, again, consider getting your child immunized to protect your family and those around you. Just a little reminder, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but the unvaccinated people are 17 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19. So we wanna avoid that. So even though you've heard about breakthrough cases um, with the Delta variant for someone that's fully vaccinated, most of those breakthrough cases are mild cases. They're not going to the hospital. And um, yes, they are having COVID-19, uh, but with limited symptoms. And so that's where we need to be. That's the best way we can defend against the grave symptoms. So should you wear a mask again? Well, I say yes, mine's off for the quick broadcast while I'm the only one in the room. Um, 
But I want to thank all of you who are still wearing your masks indoors, whether it's Market Basket, Hannaford. I just have to give note to all the supermarket chains, I guess, now. Um, if you're in the supermarket or any kind of indoor store in your offices where you don't know if people are fully vaccinated or fully protected, it's still a great idea to wear your mask. Um, we are still in substantial or high transmission, depending on if you're the CDC or the state of New Hampshire. The COVID-19 vaccine booster has been approved. If you've received um, the Pfizer vaccine more than six months ago, um, the primary series, and if you are over 65 or in a long-term care setting, you do qualify to get a booster shot. If you have an underlying medical condition between the ages of 50 and 64, you do qualify for that booster shot as well. And the same for those 18 to 49 with an underlying medical condition. People aged 18 to 64 who are at increased risk for COVID-19 exposure because of their occupation or their setting where they live um, should also consider getting a booster shot. So those are our teachers and um, our grocery store workers and anyone else, um, our healthcare workers, of course. Can you get your uh, booster shot at the same time that you get your flu shot? Absolutely. So if it's time for your booster dose, make one trip, get your flu shot at the same time. If you're not eligible for that booster because you had Moderna or you don't meet any of these criteria, just make sure you get your flu shot. So you'll see our crush that flu bug uh, sign. You should see them around Nashua. Uh, we have a great scarecrow who's going up on Main Street. Um, really promoting that flu shot, still very important. Many of us didn't get sick last summer, or last summer, last winter, uh, because we had our flu shots and we wore our masks and washed our hands a lot. So just a few reminders on COVID protocol, some safety reminders. Get that vaccine if you're eligible. Wash your hands frequently. Cough into your bent elbow or a tissue. Avoid touching your face. Practice physical distancing. If you feel sick, unless it's an emergency, stay home and call your doctor about your symptoms. And just the last reminders, clean frequently, wear that mask, and practice wellness and stress relief. Be sure your family uh, follows the same guidelines. Some other public health announcements. Our clinic is open. We offer immunizations on Tuesdays from 4 to 7 and on Fridays from 9 to 12. Those are all immunizations, especially childhood ones. So if you need to catch up on those, please call our clinic at 589-4500, option two, and make an appointment. We also do STD, HIV, and HCV testing every Thursday from 3 to 6 p.m. on 18 Mulberry Street. And in addition, we do lead testing at all of our clinics. So come on in and take advantage of the services we offer. And finally, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Early detection saves lives. Women over 40 years old should have an annual mammogram um, or every one to two years and a breast self-exam in between. Uh, if you need more information, there's some great tutorials and great videos up on nationalbreastcancer.org. But take care of yourself and wear your pink and show, um, show that in support of those who are living with breast cancer and fighting this disease. And one more reminder, because I can't resist, if you need a COVID shot, vaccines.nh.gov. Or you can just go to vaccines.gov and you can find a pharmacy near you that has the COVID vaccine. We'll be right back with our first guest. Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. I'm Jane Goodman, Public Health Network Services Coordinator for the Nashua Division of Public Health and Community Services. And I'm joined today by the Youth Council 
And we have Casey Castor, Executive Director, and I have Russell Schechtel, who is a mental health counselor with the Youth Council. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. For, and yeah, thank you for coming on to tell us about um, your agency and all the important services you provide to the Nashua area. Uh, so Casey, I'm going to start with you. If you could just give us a little history about the Youth Council when it started and the mission and those kind of things. Sure, yeah. So the Youth Council started about 47 years ago here in Nashua. We serve the greater Nashua area um, and, and we provide mental health services to youth uh, as well as um, some programming around um, prevention services for substance use prevention um, and uh, alternative suspension. And we also have a court diversion program for the juvenile court system uh, in the greater Nashua area. Uh, we, we originally started out downtown in Nashua, right, right around uh, the city, city hall. Mm -hmm. um, and just this past spring, we moved over to Northeastern Boulevard. Um, we have a new office uh, and we have about six counselors that work with us, um, both in the schools, um, mental health counselors and substance prevention counselors. Uh, in the schools and also um, in our offices. Uh, and they, they really coordinate services, um, mental health and substance use evaluations uh, and assessments and referrals um, for all the programs that we serve. So uh, when we get referrals to the court diversion program, we have kids go through um, about a three month process where they really, uh, it, it takes away the uh, the charges that they would mm -hmm. face in court. Well, we'll they... get to that. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want to give it all away in the first sure. few minutes, but we do. You do have that court diversion program, uh, the counseling services, alternative suspension. So we'll talk about each of those yeah. um, in a little bit more detail. So I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I don't want to be done too soon because they have a lot to tell us. Um, and Russell, you work as a counselor. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'm a mental health counselor there. I've been there. Um, since 2019, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like towards the end of 2019, um, and I pretty much meet with kids that come to an alternative suspension center, mm -hmm. um, work in the court diversion program, see individuals for uh, individual therapy, and I also process the intake. So when people call in seeking the services, they talk with me, and then I help direct them on where to go. Right. So if you are in need of services, you can call the Youth Council and ask for Russell. Absolutely. And um, that's at the direct line. And we'll pop that number up at the end of the show as well so that people can jot it down. Um, so let's go back. So we talk about counseling services and you spoke about them being in the schools and also being um, in your offices. So how, how do you work in the schools? How does that work? So we have, um, we have four counselors embedded in um, the Nashua middle schools and high schools. Mm -hmm. So um, one, one of our counselors works at, splits their time between two of the high, uh, between both high schools. Uh, and then we have one person at each of the high schools. And then we have a counselor that works in between two of the middle schools. Um, okay. And then Russell is, you know, adds into the team. Um, he's based in our office, but he actually helps to support um, the groups that we provide, the group support services, because we're really seeing even with having counselors in the schools working with the guidance departments that, um, you know, there's a really high demand, um, mm -hmm. especially since we've come back to school from COVID and mm -hmm. um, a lot of anxiety. And, and so we're able to reach more students if we're, um, if we're getting, in the, getting them into groups while they're waiting to see individual counselors. Okay, so the, gr so the groups that you're doing so your work in the schools is all support groups or is that different? No, or is there counseling so the embedded also? counselors actually, um, they work uh, in an, on just, they have offices right there and they're mm -hmm. referred, they get referrals from um, the administrative sa staff and also the, the guidance department. Um, and their, their work really focuses a lot on substance use prevention. So uh, if a child is caught with um, substances at school or is, is using substances, um, they can get referred to the, the counselors um, and then they, they see them on a, on a short term basis and mm -hmm. the counselors work with them to kind of evaluate their needs and some of the root causes of their use and then helps to ref either refer them to more intensive services, have them join a group. Um, mm -hmm. We kind of have a, a, an array of, of ways to connect them to resources in the community. So um, can a teacher refer or is it like, you know, how does it work? Does it usually end up going through guidance? And Yeah, teachers do refer. Teachers, yeah. guidance counselors, um, and the assistants and, and principals. And is it um, based solely on substance misuse or if you have any other issues going on, are there ways that you're addressing those or we... Is it the focus mostly on the substance misuse right it, now? It generally comes to us through a substance misuse issue, but it's it's really mental health and substance misuse focused. So 
Um, you know, we know that with a lot of, of kids that might be using substances, um, there's, there's underlying, you know, mental health or um, stressors in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so we really focus on the sort of mental and um, behavioral health um, supports that we can provide. But kids, and, and Russell's done the work in the schools, so mm -hmm. he can talk more, but I mean, kids come even with the, if they're not using substances, but they're, they're just needing someone to talk to. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times, you know, kids with, with certain struggles, they're at risk for using. Mm -hmm. So those are the kids that we also want to do too, like pre-intervention mm -hmm. stuff. Absolutely. So um, a lot of the times what happens, as Casey had mentioned, guidance counselors, teachers, school psychologists, they'll reach out to the, um, the staff in the schools and say, hey, I think, you know, I have a, um, you know, a kid who could use, you know, um, help in a certain area. And then they meet with them. And then it really, from there, um, other goes to like individual basis. Sometimes they do get referred to certain groups that the mm -hmm. staff run in the schools. Um, and then you also kind of work to try to help, I apologize, That's um, okay. work in trying to help even find services outside of, of the school. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot of what they do in the school. And I know um, currently we're working on establishing a variety of groups to be in the school. Mm -hmm. Then, So I know uh, we've spoke with a lot of staff from the variety of schools and they're really excited because there's a lot of What's amazing is not just the interest from the school staff, but interest from the kids themselves of seeking mm. out help. A lot of kids are asking to meet with people. Yeah, so that's like a plus minus. Absolutely. You know, you have a lot of kids asking, but they're asking, which is really important. They yes. know to ask for help, uh, which is critical. And I want to go back to something you said, Casey, and maybe you can address it, Russell, too. As you said, you know, mental health issues, depression, anxiety has really skyrocketed during this pandemic. And, you know, not only among adults, of course, but the kids and the kids from the social isolation and and those kind of things. So have you tailored anything new because of that or just really trying to stay ahead of it at this point? Are you seeing demand go up? Definitely seeing demand go up. I, I would say, you know, staying ahead of it. You know, we were kind of hit with the world trying to figure out on ourselves, but I'm really proud of the way that we uh, attacked COVID when it started and identifying a way to use telehealth and reach out to the kids in the schools and the kids that we see individually. Um, I also, you know, what I see too is not only the social isolation, but now that the world is starting to kind of shift to going back into public, we're seeing a lot of social anxiety mm -hmm. because a lot of people aren't really sure how to interact with people anymore. Right. And, you know, and, and there seems to be this um, dichotomy of, people who are really, really comfortable in that isolation and they seem to thrive and now they're being put back in a, you know, an environment where they were saying, oh, well, I'm out of my comfort zone. And then you have the people who were really struggling with the isolation, but now they're back with people and you see an uptick in their emotional well-being. So there really is this, uh, as I said, dichotomous world that we're seeing as mental health counselors. It's like you can't win. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't win But we can just losing. try our best to, to help them overcome. Um, and to answer the other part of your question, like other things that we've done, uh, we worked with the Nashua school system and uh, developed a healthy coping skills and stress management mm -hmm. group that ran throughout the summer, which I think was, was we had a, a, a real interest in it. And um, I think it was very positive and the, and the kids really seemed to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And was that with middle school or high school? Or? Middle school kids, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And are you seeing a big difference between middle school and high school kids and how they've managed through the pandemic or? Uh, for, for me personally, yeah, I, I work with, um, you know, the age group that I kind of was elementary, a little bit of elementary, middle and high school. And so I, I do see um, the high schoolers, they're more accustomed to school. They have a memory of school. But a lot of the kids who are in middle school, some of them have actually, for example, seventh graders this year never really got to go to sixth grade. So, so it's a whole new transition for them. Um, and so they almost kind of skipped a year and and. So for them, that aspect, I think, has become very, very difficult. And with the high schoolers, what you see is they're really close to, especially the ones that are juniors and seniors, you know, they missed out on some pretty important formative aspects, you know, prom and graduation. And, and even though I think the schools did an amazing job at adapting and, and providing opportunities, there still is this morning that I never had, I got to have that traditional experience. Right. And now how are they going to take this wild and crazy year and then move on outside of that? Yeah. And if I may add too, I mean, we, we're, we're dealing with uh, definitely an increase related to COVID, but um, we were already, you know, this is almost a, a second crisis for mm -hmm. a lot of our students. Um, 
because you know for for several years we've had a lot of students who were dealing with issues related to substance misuse you know we know that the opioid epidemic was really hitting this community and a lot of communities in Nashua very uh, in New Hampshire very hard Absolutely. and so leading up to COVID we were already you know seeing a lot more kids with mental health needs they're very difficult family situations where they're you know maybe not at home with mom and dad anymore, um, losing parents, living with ca other caregivers. And so when you know COVID came along and, and everything really shifted to remote learning, um, those kids who are kind of already in crisis um, were dealing with an extra thing mm -hmm. on top of it. And, and we tried to mm -hmm. take kind of a two-pronged approach to um, not only providing the mental health services, but our suspension center, which usually serves middle school kids if they get out of school suspension, mm -hmm. Uh, they come in and they can keep up with their work and get lunches. Um, that shifted to a remote learning center, like a lot of the after-school programs, so that there were um, a consistent seven kids that came um, every day and they could do their work at, at our center um, because they didn't have, you know, a good setup at home. Um, well, there must have been fewer suspensions during COVID. It, so there was no suspension, was like, so it allowed us been, to, yeah. yeah, move over to that remote space. And, and then those kids that came to our remote program um, got the same services that the suspension center students do. So they got mental health evaluation, substance use mm -hmm. assessment, um, you know, referrals where we could make them. A lot of it was telehealth at that point. And then as soon as things shifted back to in-person last spring, um, I'm really, you know, very proud that our, our team swung into action mm -hmm. and, and those groups that, those coping skills groups, we had those going within a month of um, oh, full re-entry to the schools because we were just hearing from the guidance counselors like we need we need something, we really need the support. And so those ran through the summer and now we're um, you know, continuing with groups. And we have a, I don't know if we can talk about the um, partnership with pu the public health department. Oh, and, of course. <laughs> and that group that we're working on. But um, the state had some funding to help support um, ELL students, mm -hmm. um, you know, and post COVID. And I'm just, for our viewers, ELL. <laughs> yeah, thanks. ELL Eng is English language learners. Thank so you. these are students um, who don't speak English as a first language or at mm -hmm. home, uh, their, their family speaks uh, another language. And in talking with the guidance department and you know, really looking at what are the needs, um, at the middle school level, there was a, some guidance counselors that were really saying that for these English language students, um, there's a lot of kids that are coming into Nashua that are immigrants or refugees. Mm -hmm. They've experienced potentially considerable trauma uh, in their home country or in their journey here. Um, then they went, into remote learning, which is something that they had never experienced before. And so they really wanted some something mental health focused and, and coping skills focused for, for those youth. Mm -hmm. um, and so we worked over the summer to kind of come up with an idea of having our counselors, Russell and, and one of our counselors at the high school level, um, work uh, with um, uh, folks with lived experience as either refugees mm -hmm. or immigrants to co-facilitate groups in the schools for the ELL students. Mm -hmm. um, the idea being that our counselors can really provide those coping skills and you know helping kids understand the trauma and how it's affecting mm -hmm. them um, in the classroom and give them some skills to, to sort of regulate themselves. Um, and then the co-facilitators who are actually coming as um, some of the community, sorry, the community health workers at mm -hmm. public health um, who have lived experience as immigrants and Absolutely. refugees to give kind of their perspective on helping kids assimilate and just talking through everything that is, you know, you face when you come to a new country and you're in a whole new school system. Mm -hmm. So that'll be starting up um, later this fall and, and winter at each of the middle schools and high schools. And we're, we're you know, really thrilled to, to be able to provide that support because we know that those kids, um, you know, there's a possibility that they kind of slip through the cracks a little bit more if they're not able to advocate for services. That's a, a, a good example too for the kids. Like you know, I know our community health workers are terrific. Shout out to them yeah. um, because they have made their way and they're really um, so essential to our work. Right. Um, in so many ways, you know, from you know soup to nuts. But for you guys, I think that'll be great partnership mm -hmm. um, to have that co-facilitation and that example. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned some other support groups. You have stress management, anger management. Um, did I miss an executive functioning? Tell us about that, Russell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so this executive functioning group is something that um, my coworkers and I have been discussing for quite a while. And, and so now we're able to kind of put it together and we kind of created a curriculum. Because, um, you know, a lot of what happens is 
there's a lot of focus on depression and anxiety, but there are a lot of people who struggle with executive functioning, and mm -hmm. it kind of somehow gets more um, previewed as behavioral mm -hmm. rather than actual mental health. And there's actually some real cognitive struggles that they deal with that leads to substance use, depression, and anxiety. So mm -hmm. we kind of created this eight-week program um, kind of discussing about what executive functioning is, um, really helping the kids learn and examine themselves, like what are their strengths, what are their challenges, and then teach them skills such as organization skills, how to plan ahead, time management, um, healthy coping skills and stress mm -hmm. management. And so that group, um, I'm proud of, I'm, the way it's kind of looking, it's all been developed, everything's been set, and we're just kind of finalizing dates and times now. Mm -hmm. And those are gonna be run in the schools. Mm -hmm. So we have um, the three middle schools and um, I think we're going to start there and then look at broadening out maybe into the high schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now, how are those kids identified? Because that's a very different, um, you know, executive function is a different mm -hmm. thing that people may be looking for. Yeah, that's a great question. So some of it, they're either identified by, as I said, behavioral issues. Sometimes they have behavioral issues in school where they're having a hard time keeping up with work or maybe they're being like hyperactive. You know, when we talk about executive functioning, a lot of people think like attention deficit disorder, ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of it's kind of based on um, teacher's recommendations of saying, oh, you know, I think this kid kind of struggles. Some of them um, are coded, so they may have a 504 mm -hmm. plan or an IEP. Um, so I think right now we're taking um, recommendations from the guidance counselors and teachers mm -hmm. um, and kind of sorting out. And we're hoping to make this kind of be almost an ongoing group, like in kind of like semesters. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome. That's an incredible so so we've t covered our support groups and I know Casey you had started to talk and I, I apologize I cut you off but I oh, knew there no was more to it yeah. I want to hear about your court diversion program um, because you know this is a big deal too like the work you guys are doing is really it's incredible you're really looking at every angle so tell me a little bit more about the court diversion program and how that came to be and sure yeah I, I mean the exactly you know when that came to be at the youth council I'm not sure but I, I know it's been um, a long-standing program within our agency, um, you know, 20 years or more. And, and really the, the idea behind court diversion is um, kids that get a, get a charge, a, a misdemeanor level, a minor um, level charge, uh, the court diversion program helps them to uh, go through a program where they are being held accountable for, mm -hmm. um, for, the, for what they've, they've committed, but also helps them kind of look at and develop and think about um, what happened and and work on some consequences that are assigned by a panel of um, of volunteers from the community mm -hmm. um, and they do about three months uh, of sort of check-ins and turning in work and sometimes it's groups that they take part in um, and then at the end of that they can leave the program without a criminal record so they wouldn't have a juvenile record mm -hmm. um, so which nice. which we know you know kids kids that have a juvenile record um, if you have a, a criminal record, you can't apply for federal student aid. Um, you know, you, you kind of, th there's a, a number of steps that really can stand in your way and, and create barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're lucky. We have a very long, long standing um, staff member, Holly Mara, who's the manager of that program. Um, and and we, we really focus in that program because we provide mental health services and evaluations uh, as well as substance use. That's, you know, a big part of it is just as kids come through the program, they get evaluated for um, any sort of mental health risk factors, mm -hmm. any substance use, um, and then if if they're if they kind of hit certain markers on that, then they they take part in a program called Challenge, which is really focused on um, substance use prevention and and having them kind of understand uh, if they are using what the consequences of that might be, um, and then ongoing referral. So um, there's uh, actually an agency. Uh, here, the Revive Recovery Program, they, they have a peer support group. So we can try to connect those kids then so that they have something ongoing um, after they finish the program. Um, but the program is really, it's, it's excellent. And we have excellent partnerships with um, the local police departments here in, in Nashua, Merrimack, Amherst, Wilton. Um, so actually the police refer, uh, refer kids to us um, or the prosecutors in the communities. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can meet with our counselors and kind of go through that process. It's For about a lot giving kids, second chance. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, you know, Early, a second so that, chance. Yeah. And, um, and for a lot of kids, they have not necessarily been connected to services before. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, there's been some ongoing issues, but their families haven't really 
get been given resources and so if they went to court you know there would be a, a maybe a fine um, maybe some some sort of follow-up with probation and parole but this way they're able to connect with resources to kind of give them a good foundation of support coming out of this um, to be able to you know move forward and, and move on wow you guys are busy <laughs> So, and then the last one, which you touched on a little bit, um, was the accountable suspension or alternative suspension, mm -hmm. which, you know, obviously was not going on during COVID. Um, <clears throat> but did you, uh, has that picked up again? Or are you, people coming, do they come to your office to do the suspension? Or how does that work? They do, yeah. So that program, um, as I said, during COVID, we were having uh, just the same the same kids coming through the whole kind of remote learning time. And then last spring, we started with suspension um, center again once things went back in person. And we had a very minimal number. I, I know that the schools were really working on just working through behaviors in the schools and keeping kids in class because that's where mm -hmm. kids need to be. And certainly that's what they're continuing to focus on um, this fall. But we, we have started to have a few kids come through Suspension Center. Mm -hmm. um, kids will stay anywhere from, we do it uh, four days a week, so Monday through Thursday. Mm -hmm. if, a, if a kid gets suspended in either f uh, from fifth up to eighth grade, they can be referred by the administration to come uh, to us and then they can actually still complete their work. Mm -hmm. A lot of times if a kid is um, suspended from school and just out of school for 10 days, they'll miss, they, they might not necessarily do the work to keep up with the classes. Right. Um, they don't get the lunch. If they, if they get lunch at school, they don't get a lunch. So we provide kind of a, it's a, it's a small classroom setting that we have in our office uh, and a really excellent coordinator, Mary High. Um, and again, it, it helps them to get a space to, to do their work, but also connect with our counselors. Yeah, so they get have an some evaluation. counseling at the same time. Like, exactly. let's get to the root of why this happened. And Yeah, at, at least an evaluation and, and provide them with some referrals and resources. Mm -hmm. And often what happens is that, um, you know, they'll, Russell actually does the, the evaluations with the kids and meets with them and then, you know, checks in with them while they're in our office. Mm -hmm. But then he, uh, that information gets passed along, the referrals and, and information about, you know, his evaluation to our middle school staff that work at the middle school so that when the, the child is back in school, um, someone can check in with them and just say, hey, how are you doing? You know, is, if you need to talk to someone, I'm here. Um, so it kind of provides that continuity for, mm -hmm. for kids. So this may be a loaded question, but how do you involve the parents in all of this? Because, you know, that's a really critical thing. These kids mm -hmm. are going home at the end of the day, um, sometimes not always to the uh, easiest home situation. So how do you get the parents involved? And yeah. what is their responsibility um, in some of this? Right. Yes. Oh, go ahead. You know, well, yes. Yeah, so well, I was going to say, so the assessment that I, that I do with the kids encompasses a wide variety of, of questions and things. And so not only does... The, a copy of my assessment go to our staff in the schools, but it goes to the vice principal, it goes to their guidance counselor, mm -hmm. and then a copy of it gets sent home to their parents. Okay. Um, and so to answer your question and, and how like we hold them accountable, in that assessment, I write not only my clinical impression, but my clinical recommendations. And so, so it's not like I meet with them and then here you go and then that's it. I may say, you know, if someone's kind of, um, you know, reporting, hey, you know, I'm feeling really depressed or, um, I'm being bullied at school and they're not quite sure how to handle it, um, you know, and they don't have therapy, I may recommend, you know, maybe reaching out to a, a, an agency and seeking, uh, you know, outside counsel. Mm -hmm. um, other things would be, you know, one of the things we ask the kids are like, what are their goals? Um, and so sometimes, you know, the, you know, I had someone the other day who wanted to be like the next Jennifer Lopez or Beyonce. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and then I have some people that want to open their own bike shop. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think it's really good for the parents to know that um, because my recommendations would be let's try to find some activities where they can utilize these interests and, and work towards these goals. Um, and there's been many occasions where um, I've had parents call and asking questions because I'm open to that and in the schools as well saying, well, you wrote this recommendation or you have this impression. Tell me more how we can do. And I will communicate with the parents and I'll communicate with the schools and elaborate even more if needed and kind of give um, referrals or um, you know, more opinions in, in, in order to help them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we also, we collaborate with a lot of the community organizations here in Nashua that um, can provide, you know, support for families. So if we have a family that might benefit from a parenting class or, is, you know, is looking for um, case management support to kind of help assemble services, we can refer out to Waypoint or 
um, fast forward program or some of the other programs that we work with. So we do work a lot with the other community partners to make sure that we're helping to provide that support. And, and we really engage the parents at the suspension uh, center program and kind of speaking with them, sharing that information, and the same with court diversion. The parents actually come through the panel process and the check-ins with the, with the youth, and so they're involved in that process throughout. Wow. So um, if you want to volunteer or donate, uh, visit tycnh.org. Mm -hmm. That's the Youth Council of, did I, I'm going to say it, the Youth Council of Nashua. Uh, it's actually NH. Um, the Youth Council NH. So New, oh, New NH. Oh, yeah, tycnh.org. <laughs> I'm like, Nashua, no, it's NH. Okay. And you guys do serve, you know, a lot more than just the city of mm -hmm. Nashua. Like you said, you're out in uh, the surrounding towns. And just like we do at Public Health, you know, we are um, the seat of the Public Health Network, so we do the 12 surrounding towns as well. Right. Um, so there's a lot of resources here, so I encourage people, um, and especially um, the referral, um, for if you are a parent in need, if you think your child's in need, go online to this website, forward slash contact, very easy to find. You can do an anonymous referral right there. and and Russell is going to get in touch with you, it sounds like. And, or you can call the agency itself, 889-1090. And then the last thing is you do have volunteers. What do the volunteers do? Um, so volunteers come in for the court diversion panels. That's mm -hmm. generally where we have volunteers. So they'll come in. It's a monthly panel, um, one, one evening a month uh, mm -hmm. for a couple hours and just sit with other community volunteers and hear the cases and help to come up with some um, consequences and, and uh, you know, an action plan for the kids in the program. So do they serve as mentors? What kind of people choose to volunteer? It, it's, a, it's really a variety of folks. Um, they're, they're not necessarily as mentors, but more, it's like a, like a jury. Mm -hmm. um, it's similar to sitting on a jury. You know, it's, it's three, three people instead of 12, but it's, um, it's a small group of people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both, Russell and Casey. Thank, thank you. For taking some time. I appreciate it to tell us about this amazing program that is really behind the scenes, making things move along nicely. So um, we really appreciate your time and all the work you're doing for our community, and we're excited to partner with you on those ELL, English Language Learner, work, um, support groups. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, take care. <laughs> and we'll be back with our next guest in just a few minutes. The best way to dispose of expired or unwanted medicine is to use a drug take-back location. If this isn't an option and your medicine is on the FDA's flush list, flush it down the sink or toilet. If your medicine isn't on the flush list, dispose of it at home by mixing it with an unappealing substance like dirt, cat litter, or used coffee grounds in a sealed plastic bag and put the sealed bag in your household trash and scratch out any personal information from the label on the medicine bottle or packaging. For more information and to find a Take Back site near you, visit www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. Welcome back to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. I'm joined now by Lisa Vasquez, Behavioral Health Strategist with the Division. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. I uh, want to give everyone at home a little background on uh, what you do at the division. <clears throat> I am the behavioral health strategist, and as the behavioral health strategist, I oversee grants that um, address behavioral health issues. So things like uh, substance use, um, continuum of care of, of like for treatment providers of substance mm -hmm. use disorders. Um, things that have to do with mental health awareness and also suicide uh, prevention. Mm -hmm. And I, I know part of your job is um, to head up the mayor's opioid task force. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so as two of the grants, so the substance misuse prevention grant and the continuum of care grant really have to do uh, with raising awareness of the resources that are in the community, as well as bringing uh, community partners together to strengthen relationships and referrals in between um, agencies. Um, the Mayor's Opioid Task Force really helps us to do those two things. Um, so through that um, task force, it brings together agencies like the Mental Health Center, uh, Harbor Care, um, the Police Department, AMR, 
which is our uh, American Medical Response um, mm -hmm. Fire Department, and brings everyone together so we can talk about how many overdoses we're seeing, if there's any significant changes in the city uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to overdoses, and it really informs us and let us know what things are working um, that we are are working on as, as different agencies and as agencies uh, together in the task force. And we can, you know, either uh, spend more time on a strategy or switch over to a different strategy if, if that is needed. Um, some of the strategies that have come out of the Mayor's Opioid mm -hmm. Task Force are uh, Narcan distribution, our um, syringe service alliance of the natural area was born out of the Mayor's Opioid Task mm -hmm. Force. Um, bringing everyone together um, to create that partnership between Revive, um, the HIV uh, Task Force, and the Division of Public Health um, to really be able to uh, provide that service to the community. Other things were, um, like a few years ago, was the Safe Stations program, which now has become the Doorway, which is a, a statewide initiative, um, along with things like the billboards that we put up to really mm -hmm. let people know about resources, about mental health awareness, um, yeah, things like that. Yeah, and so I just wanna back up because you mentioned the continuum of care. If you mm -hmm. could just explain what that means to our, our public, so to speak. Yes, <laughs> so the continuum of care is really when you think about uh, substance use, it doesn't like come out of the blue. Um, something needs to, really impacts everyone's entire life. It can impact an entire life. So the continuum of care looks at a person's life and environment. So from prevention, early intervention, treatment and recovery supports, that's the continuum. And people at different points in their life might be in different areas of that continuum. We wish that everyone was in the prevention um, mm -hmm. side so that we can you know, prevent substance use, uh, prevent mental health crisis, prevent um, you know, suicide suicidal ideation in our communities, but um, people are in, in different sections, so we need to make sure that there are services available at each um, part of the continuum, mm -hmm. and they all talk to each other, so that if someone moves from one section to the other, there can be uh, communication. Mm -hmm. So speaking of wanting everyone to stay in prevention and <laughs> be there, um, I know that um, you do a lot of work with the schools. It's been a little bit on a hiatus because of COVID. Uh, but what are some of the things that um, this group and others are doing in the schools around substance misuse? So right now, this month, um, at the end of the month, we have Red Ribbon Week. And that is a week that is dedicated to um, substance misuse prevention. Mm -hmm. um, the Usually in the past, we had speakers and um, go into the schools, we did like assemblies, um, but because of COVID, those have been really, are non-existent right mm -hmm. now. Um, but we still are doing, celebrating Red Ribbon Week in different ways. You might see kiddos come home with red ribbons. You might see uh, kiddos come home uh, with like red tulip bulbs mm -hmm. that um, are part of a uh, project called Plant the Promise. Um, I know that some in the Nashua area are doing that. They might be doing some of that as well in other schools within the region. Um, you plant those tulip bulbs and hopefully by the spring they'll come up um, and that is the fulfillment of the promise that you made to stay uh, drug free. Mm. So a nice little reward yes. in the spring. Um, um, teachers in the Nashua district also do like um, door decoration contests. Mm -hmm. So they each decorate their door with um, drug prevention messages. Mm -hmm. And then um, usually one of the, you know, doors in each school wins. Um, they also have a nationwide contest for those. And you can send the picture to uh, the Red Ribbon Week. Um, there's a website for Red Ribbon, mm -hmm. Ribbon Week. Um, and you can send it there and see who wins nationally. Um, Hudson School District is actually going to do a parent info night during mm -hmm. Red Ribbon Week where they are going to talk about um, tips for connecting with your kids as well as uh, vaping, which is a big issue mm -hmm. in um, youth in general with, uh, throughout the country. But specifically here in Nashua and our surrounding towns, vaping has, um, even as, as young as um, middle school, has really increased in the past like five years. Mm -hmm. And just uh, on vaping, because this uh, happens to be one of my passion topics as well, um, people don't always realize the risks of vaping and why, why we in public health and in the community are so concerned about vaping. 
um, you know, just that it really does tend to lead and can lead. Well, first of all, there's nicotine in it, which is an addictive substance. Yes. So uh, a, a vaping product is also considered a nicotine delivery system. Okay. Um, some people don't um, really understand what they are. It's really hard to uh, keep up with the kids sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the products and how they look is changing constantly. Um, at one point, they looked like USB ports that kids use already mm -hmm. in school. So kids were using them in school. Um, they could plug them right into their computer. They to could charge plug them, them right yep. into the computer to charge. Yes, um, but um, some schools were taking like really uh, drastic measures to really reduce um, the amount of vaping in their campuses. Um, things like um, prohibiting any sort of USB-like uh, object in the school which really um, is hard for the kids because they use those so many mm -hmm. times for like schoolwork, the actual USBs. Yeah. Um, Although less and less, there's less a lot and of less, storage yes. in the cloud. Yes, <laughs> um, and then um, some schools were taking, um, like limiting the amount of bathrooms uh, available throughout the day so that mm -hmm. people wouldn't go to the bathroom to vape. Um, so it really, puts a lot of pressure on teachers and school staff to, you know, monitor those things. Mm -hmm. um, and also a lot of um, kids and parents think they're just vaping water or um, glycerin, which is still not a good thing to mm -hmm. vape anyway, um, because it's chemicals. Um, but they really don't understand that there's nicotine in mm -hmm. those products. And an aerosol as well. Exactly. Um, and really, anything you shouldn't aerosolize anything and inhale it mm -hmm. um, our lungs aren't created for that right they're created for air um, not for aerosolized uh, liquids mm -hmm. so all those things create issues um, especially in a developing body as are like middle schoolers and high schoolers mm -hmm. and the brain development and Correct. all of that um, so we've seen in numbers that smoking has declined but vaping has gone up so, so yes, combustible cigarette use has declined, but then um, vaping or nic other nicotine delivery systems have increased within like middle school and high school mm -hmm. populations. So we wanna, that is also part of our Red Ribbon Week, um, you know, to not use that substance. Correct, and, and the most important thing as always is for parents to be involved with their kids and talk about these um, um, products, but also have, um, rules are, mm -hmm. and consequences around the use of, of these products. Because if kids don't know that their parents don't want them to use them, they're gonna be more likely to use. So if my, for example, I tell my kids, this is against like our house rules and you, there will be consequences if you use them. That's different than kids not ever having the conversation and mm -hmm. not knowing specifically if their parents are for or against that product. Mm -hmm. So Red Ribbon Week, even though we have fewer speakers in the school. It's a great opportunity for parents to bring this up when you see that red ribbon coming home, to really have that conversation with your kids. And they are tough conversations to have, but um, they're really necessary, like, like you said, um, because you know kids look up to their parents. So you know that's the first person they need to be hearing this from. Yes, and it's important too, if we can provide a good example for our kids by not using these products, it'll help them um, not use the products as well. Because if we use them um, as a way to release our stress or um, any sort of way, they'll see it as not negative. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important for give a, a good example and then have a conversation mm -hmm. um, about the use of these products. Another really important thing that's happening that is linked to <laughs> a Red Ribbon Week is um, Take Back Day, which is October 23rd. You're stealing all my questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> October 23rd um, from 10 to 2. From yeah. 10 to 2. 10 to 2. Um, most of our police departments in our region are participating. So um, if you live in Nashville, you can go to uh, DPW right on uh, Stello's drive and um, it'll be a drive through and you can you don't even have to get out of your car just um, throw in your unused unwanted medications that you may have at home um, it's really important that um, if you have any medication doesn't matter what it is that you're no longer using to dispose of it it's um, really dangerous to leave them in your home you never know who, who's coming into your home that might have a substance use disorder mm -hmm. or a child that might want to experiment with um, 
you know, that substance. So even if it's um, thyroid medication, high blood pressure medication, um, or opioids, um, anything really is important to keep mm -hmm. it locked up and away from people who are not, who it is not prescribed to. But if you're done with it, it's really important to get rid of them mm -hmm. in a way that is safe. And the safest way would be to go to the take back day, which is going to be on uh, Saturday the 23rd, again, from 10 to one, uh, 10 to 2. <laughs> or uh, many of our police departments have permanent drop boxes where you can drop off those medications, as well as both of our hospitals have um, take back boxes. And um, most of the pharmacies on Main Street also have take back boxes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we will pop a list up here of the permanent ones at, that are at the police stations, but it was a good reminder too that the hospitals do have them and some of the pharmacies. And, um, and the origin of this really, we're seeing, you know, the big, you know, like you said, no medication that's left over you wanna have laying around the house or accessible. But when we had prescription painkillers and those kind of things, getting into the wrong hands and creating addictive or, um, you know, behaviors and problems. Really, this became very critical. Um, in the past, have you collected a lot? Um, yes, so they've collected thousands of pounds, uh, hundreds of pounds of medications, um, like statewide, and thousands of pounds of medication, like nationwide. Um, so, yes, we do collect a lot of um, pounds of medication during mm -hmm. those uh, take backs. But it's also important to look at the data. Like right before the opioid crisis, we had a prescription drug crisis where we saw a lot of people um, using prescription drugs um, in, in a way that was unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what we're seeing now is that a lot of people, uh, what we saw a couple of years ago was that there was an increase in the prescription of uh, like stimulants like Adderall, Ritalin, things like that. Um, and that is also problematic because it's a it's very similar to meth, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is also a stimulant. So um, just like people went from prescription opioids to heroin, they could go from prescription stimulants to meth. So we really want to make sure that any medication is used as prescribed, mm -hmm. never shared, and disposed of is if it's no longer needed. Mm -hmm. So very important. So remember October 23rd, that's coming up in just a couple weeks. Um, to gather that stuff together. If you want to do it ahead of time, there are those permanent drop-off locations at the hospitals. Anything else you want to leave us with for words of wisdom today, Lisa? Yes. <laughs> it's, always talk to your kids. Um, really important. Use open-ended, uh, like open-ended conversations. Um, questions. So ask them questions that you know are not going to be answered by yes and no. So instead of asking them, did you have a good day today? It's going to be yes. <laughs> Always um, ask them um, like what was good about your day today? Um, was there anything challenging today? Uh, were, um, and if they have something challenging, were you able to get help for that? Mm -hmm. Things like that so that you can actually have a, a real conversation with your child as opposed to them coming in saying, I had a good day and just moving on. Mm -hmm. So um, open in the conversations to uh, really make sure you have a good uh, communication with your child. Makes the dinner table more interesting yes. too. And I always say like family dinner, so important. If you can, if you can squeeze it in, even if it's a half an hour, just to all sit around and be able to talk to one another and have those open conversations. Yes. So, well, Lisa, thank you so much. These two things are on our list of things to look out for, Red Ribbon Week and Drug Take Back Day. And thank you for all the work you're doing at the division and coordinating the, the task force and getting people to work together um, and collaborate because we're all in this together. Yes, and if people want to know more about the Mayor's Opioid Task Force, they can always go to our website, which is www.nashuanh.gov. They can go under the Division of uh, Public Health Community Services um, part of the website and look under the Mayor's Task Force to get information about uh, what we're working on or how to get in touch or if they want to be part of it when we meet. Mm -hmm. And we also have some referral guides there too as well to um help people navigate the system if there is an issue. Right. Um, so, so great. We'll have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you in the office. <laughs> <laughs> like see you in 10 minutes. All righty. <clears throat> and thank you all for joining us on Public Health Matters.
I got something to say Come on, listen to me We're living our lives drug free yeah. Oh yeah I'm drug free You're drug free Everybody celebrate with me It's Red Ribbon Week We're the Red Ribbon Crew And we're proud to be drug free does everyone here know what Red Ribbon Week is? Red Ribbon Week is a celebration that happens every year during the last week in October. Millions of kids, teenagers, and adults in the United States and around the world wear red ribbons to display to their friends and family to show them all that they are committed to living a life that is free of drugs. You should have been given a red ribbon of your own to wear at this Red Ribbon Rally. Wear yours to school. At your grandma's house. While making your latest viral video. When playing video games with your friends. And at any other place, you want people to know that you believe in living a life free of drugs and alcohol. Here's how Red Ribbon Week got started. Like many hugely positive things, Red Ribbon Week grew out of something profoundly negative. On February 7, 1985, Enrique Kiki Camarena had been kidnapped by drug dealers, never to be seen alive again. For his kidnappers, their story was to end there. However, for his family, friends, and a grateful nation, it was only the beginning. They pledged not to let his legacy fade and his sacrifice be in vain. Across the country, citizens wore and displayed red ribbon. I wear my red ribbon every day not only in memory of Special Agent Camarena, but for all those whose lives were lost trying to free the nation from drugs. Beyond that, the red ribbon symbolized the development of an attitude of intolerance regarding the use of drugs. There is nothing admirable, positive, or socially desirable about it. There is nothing desirable about drugs. They're bad. In a 1988 proclamation, Congress established Red Ribbon Week to commemorate the work and life of Kiki and to show intolerance for drugs in our schools, workplaces, and communities. DEA celebrates Red Ribbon Week with hundreds of other activities, including 5K runs and walks, drug-free carnivals, decorating contests, poster contests, and rap and poetry contests. Live your life the drug-free way. Hold up your ribbon, let's celebrate. I'm drug-free, you're drug-free. Everybody celebrate with me. Move your ribbon from side to side. Let's celebrate our drug-free lives. Yes. Hey, this is Red Ribbon Week. This week we celebrate. So come on and make me proud. Let's say the pledge out loud. I pledge to stay in school and learn the things that I need to know. I pledge to make the world a better place for kids like me to grow. I pledge to keep my dreams alive and be all that I can be. I pledge to help others and to keep myself drug free. Take a look what some of these kids do to stay drug free. I play baseball and I think that's very important. And education, that's very important. I sing, I act, I go on a lot of social media rants. I'm a very loud teenager. Love who you are as a person and not feel that you have to escape from what's real in life. My whole life right now revolves around performance and entertaining people, making people happy. Keep yourself busy, keep yourself motivated to want to do more than escaping to doing drugs to like, so you can have a fulfilled life. Thanks for joining us everyone. Oh yeah, and visit JustThinkTwice.com for information and stories about living a drug-free life. Have a great Red Ribbon Week! Parents can log on to DEA.gov for more information about preventing childhood drug addictions.